Hello everybody, I'm Peter Clausen from Bugs in Cyberspace. I've had my website up since 1997, and today we are going to be doing a tank setup video for velvet worms. They are sometimes also called peripatus. The word velvet worms is a little bit more user-friendly, I would say. They are in the phylum Onychophora, very unique phylum. Uh, another phylum you are more familiar with if you're watchers of this channel is the phylum Arthropoda, the arthropods, which include bugs and spiders, and centipedes, and various other animals with segmented bodies, antennae, and jointed legs. The two phyla, Onychophora and Arthropoda, share some similarities. I have a care sheet here that we're going to be talking about today. And before I do anything else in this video, I want to thank Mackenzie Harrison up in British Columbia, Canada, for not just sourcing these velvet worms three or so years ago, but also doing such a wonderful job in both captive breeding them, now generationally, multiple generations, but also in providing the rest of us, his customers, with an awesome care sheet. This care sheet is so helpful and I'm going to be using it um, as the basis for the tank video setup that we are about to go through. So these velvet worms, they live on the forest floor there in Barbados and it's humid and so we're going to replicate their environment as best as we can with this tank. And through the addition of live plants, they help to cycle the nutrients in the tank, which keeps mold down, and I have a light strip in there. If the plants are doing well, the plants are happy and healthy, the velvet worms should be too. And we're going to set the tank up now. I'm going to first show you the lowest layer of the tank, which isn't 100% necessary. People have kept them just with uh, coconut fiber or, or peat moss and uh, sphagnum moss and things like that in there. But um, I was inspired by some of the pictures that Mackenzie showed in his care sheet to just sort of go all out and follow the care sheet to a T in terms of the way he originally set his tanks up before um, the captive care of the species was really understood and what their care needs were and that they were actually less minimal than what a tank like this is going to demonstrate. So here we go. Because these velvet worms need 80 to 90 percent humidity, I'm going to put these clay balls down here in the bottom of the tank and we're going to pour water into this lower layer and it's going to sink down in there and there's always going to be a little bit of liquid down there and with this plexiglass lid up here on the top of the tank it's going to keep the humidity up to the required levels and this is a 10 gallon tank and I'm going to add in a few more of these clay pellets. Mix them up a little bit there, just because they were two different brands and they're different colors. Kind of do a, a height check there. Got to keep in mind, this is going to be the tallest thing in the tank. And it's got to be at such a level that the velvet worms, if this plant grows a little bit, aren't going to be able to come up here near the top. And so what I'm probably going to do here is grade it. And so one side is going to be higher than the other. That way I can put the plant in there a little bit lower. That'll work out nice. Now the next step is to put this screen down here on top of this layer here. Water will still be able to pass through it, but then the animals won't be able to crawl down and into that lower layer where they might like to hide in between the clay balls 
so many spaces in there, both for water and for them, and then maybe get trapped in there. And I'm going to cover this with a layer of sand. You can see that I have it going up the side of the tank there a little bit. The sand will press that down. A lot of people will wash their clay pellets and everything else they put into the tank very carefully before they do it all. That's recommended. If you want to look to the dart frog community and the way they set up their vivariums, terrariums, whatever you want to call them, that's really a good resource and example for how to set up a planted tank. And the purpose of the sand is to hold this down very nicely and allow proper drainage. Uh, someone I was talking to on Instagram, who is also keeping velvet worms, was telling me that his managed to slip in underneath the screen here and um, that he had lost them. Maybe he wasn't 100% sure that they got down below, but he was concerned that maybe they did. And so I'm trying to be extra careful here as I set up the tank to make sure that the chances of that happening are minimized. I'm finding that there are a few sinkholes where the sand is sort of sinking down past the screen and so I'm patching those with a few extra pieces of screen in those areas. One in the back corner here too. So I don't love the way this looks here with the screen. You can see the sand starting to creep down a little bit, but once the rest of the tank is set up, hopefully that won't be as noticeable. Like I said, this is the first time I've set up a tank like this, so I'm learning, and if you guys have feedback about better ways to do that, um, not so much for me because I'm not going to be doing tons of tanks like this, but for other people coming along, watching the video, if you leave it down in the comments, for others to benefit by. If you have tips, suggestions for how to do all of this in a better way, I appreciate that on their behalf, thank you. And now we're going to add in some of the soil layers, the medium layer where both the plants and the velvet worms are going to exist. And there's a variety of ingredients. Um, you guys have heard of ABG mix, which has uh, charcoal and um, fur and sphagnum moss and soil in it. I'm going to be mixing some of that in here as well as some additional ingredients, more of the same things generally, a little bit of coconut fiber for example. And then we're going to drop the plants in. I've got some cuttings that I've been growing. I don't know if you can see there in the light the root systems that have really developed nicely in these plants for the months that I've been working with them. This is a more recent acquisition as of about a month ago and really you should set your tank up in all honesty and according to his care sheet, Mackenzie Harrison's care sheet, months in advance. And the reason for that is, is that you want everything in the tank to cycle. You want it to go through that uh, phase that all soil-based tanks inevitably have to go through. This is a closed system here with organic ingredients in it. And anytime you set up a new tank like that, you're going to see a microbial war take place where um, all of these new things are interacting with each other and um, the bacteria and the fungus, they're gonna go crazy in there a little bit. You might see some mold and everything. I have some seasoned dirt from prior tanks downstairs that I'm going to use um, and it's going to work well for both the plants and for the velvet worms because it's already gone through that whole molding process. I wouldn't be surprised if a little bit occurs, but it won't be to the same degree that you might see in a new tank entirely composed of new ingredients being put into it. And so 
Typically, you're gonna to wanna to let your tank cycle for a couple months before adding your velvet worms in. Another thing that I do is, after I set this tank up, I'm going to add some velvet worms into it, and I'm gonna see how it goes before I add in the entire, the entire colony of my velvet worms, my precious velvet worms. And so that'll be a test, and I'll update you guys from time to time about how this project is going. Distilled water, better than tap water. I should probably have added the water in before I put the screen and the sand in, but here we go. I'm gonna add this in here now, and uh, we're just gonna fill that up till we can see some water down there. The sand layer absorbed a lot of it, but you can see that the water is starting to creep up there a little bit. And then the next step is going to be to put these plants in here. And uh, I want to build up the soil around this tallest plant. All right, it's time to add in some of this wonderful substrate that I've made. And I'll put links down in the caption, the description area of this video, in case you guys want to know specifically what ingredients I used in making this tank today. You can see down there that there's water up to, I don't know, about an inch and a half there, the bottom of the tank. Water is starting to saturate a little bit through this layer. The sand is quite wet at this point. Once I pop the lid on, we're gonna see how the tank does. I just kind of sprayed everything down in there after I added it. Let's talk a little bit about what's in the tank. So that over there is my peacock spike moss and it has sort of a metallic blue quality to it that I really like. This particular plant isn't displaying it right now because it sort of sat bare root there for the last month or so. And so I'm hoping that it recovers and looks much different. And then I planted some cuttings over there. There are three pieces of this Mopani wood right here. It's a kind of wood that I really like and it will provide some retreats for them. It's got some little nooks and crannies in it. This particular piece here is sort of concave, as is this piece of bark that I had in the freezer for a month right there, hoping that will provide a retreat for them. Also a place where when I come back to the tank and I don't see any around here, if I wanna check on them just to see how they're doing, take a peek. Just lift that up a little bit or one of these other pieces that isn't buried in the substrate, just sort of resting on top of it. I can get a look at them. This one here also is concave. And after I have the lid on this tank, you see it's dry underneath there. I think that the humidity is going to sort of saturate through the system here and be more distributed evenly through it. So I'm gonna pop the lid on now and we'll take a look at it with the colored LED lights. I think it's gonna look pretty cool. Just a quick look at the tank here, looking nice and green before I put this pink light back on again. 
And so we're going to introduce the velvet worms in now. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the points here in Mackenzie's care sheet while I do this. And I just posted on my Instagram account a little clip about this tank I just built, giving everybody a heads up. And in the video, there was a group of velvet worms like this, and people were commenting. And Mackenzie, in particular, said, and I thought this was great, that the proper name for a group of velvet worms is a cuddle. And what an appropriate name that is. A few other people commented and said they thought that the bunch of them all together like that looked like an octopus. Now you can see that just as I very carefully transferred them from the temporary tank into this one, that one of them shot out the goo, that's what it's called, goo. And I had noticed when I was making the previous video that one had actually become ensnared and sort of pinned up against some of the sphagnum moss. And I had to free it. So as they are dispersing here, and I hope that none of them are ensnared by the goo, we'll keep an eye on that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the velvet worms. And their species is Epiperipatus barbadensis. And barbadensis is a reference to Barbados, where they come from. Whenever you see the word ensis on the end of a scientific name, it refers to where the animal comes from. I'm in Portland, Oregon. If something from Portland was discovered, it might be called Portlandensis for the species name. Mackenzie has suggested for this species a common name, and Barbados brown, or the Barbados brown velvet worm, were his two recommendations. And certainly he deserves naming rights for them because he is the reason that I have these at all. And he's managed to spread them around to a few different people, just a small group of people here in the United States. Pretty excited about them. Their adult size, they reach up to three, three and a half inches, according to Mackenzie. And this one is probably sitting at about two inches outstretched. Now there's no clear way in knowing how to sex them. The only way to know for sure is if you have a female and she's isolated and she gives birth. You can see that this one is starting to burrow down there. They do burrow into tanks, very secretive animals. You might look in here a couple weeks from now and think they're all gone, where did they go? Well, they do burrow and they like to hide underneath of things. I'm going to just kind of let them acclimate here to the new tank. We'll see how they do over time. And I'm just going to take a hands-off approach to them here generally. I'm only putting this initial group of, I don't know, maybe it was seven individuals in here, just to make sure that this tank is going to be a suitable habitat for them, sort of not putting all of my eggs in one basket. And so I'm going to keep some over here in this temporary tank for a while, just to make sure that there was nothing in this tank that is going to cause harm to them. I was very careful in all of the recommended ways in terms of sourcing things and sterilizing things and giving things time. It would have been better to leave this tank for a couple months to let it cycle out and to let all of the microbes in the soil strike a balance. But one of the things that I'm going to do to help achieve that 
is to pull some of this substrate that's been in this tank here for a couple months. And I'm just going to kind of spread it here on the surface of the new tank to sort of seed on a microbial level some of the bacteria, fungi, things like that, that they've been used to. And so I'm gonna spoon some more of that out here, but you guys don't wanna watch me do that for five minutes. Now breeding these velvet worms is apparently quite easy. You just leave them alone. And they apparently, if a female is fertilized by a male, it keeps them fertilized for the course of their life, which can be several years. It's not clear on how long they live. Mackenzie says that he has had some, I think for three plus years now, some of the original adults or the original specimens anyway that he sourced are still alive, which is wonderful. Uh, the male, they're not real clear on how the male transfers the sperm in this species via a spermatophore. Not sure if the female comes along and picks it up or if he inserts it into her somehow. I'm not really sure about that. I'm not sure if anybody knows how it works for this particular species, but these are one of the things that we have to learn still. And one of the reasons that they're so interesting, they are mysterious creatures. They are secretive in their habits and they have not been studied all that much in terms of this particular species, so far as I know. You can see that one as it's crawling out from under that piece of bark. Actually quite strong. And uh, we'll get a little closer here. Get a look at those claws on the tips of their feet. They seem to be something they can push in and out. Retractable, extendable. Kind of interesting how they work. Makes me want to pick up that piece of bark. <laughs> Happy with the way the tank is looking. I turned the pink light back on again. And so we have a couple different colors here showing up on the peacock moss, which if you ask me, looks a lot like the shape of their bodies, the velvet worms. I just thought it was the perfect plant. It's been a plant that I've always liked. One of my favorites and I think it just perfectly works. What a calm, peaceful animal a velvet worm is. Secretive, just slowly working its way through the world. You wouldn't expect that they could be so deadly, shooting prey with their goo, and trapping it, and then as it struggles to free itself, the velvet worm just casually walks up to it and feeds on it. What a life, huh? I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video. I'm very happy with how the tank came out and I'll update you guys from time to time on how they're doing in here and hopefully we will be able to move the others into this tank in a month or so, assuming the ones in this tank do well. Thanks for watching if you have comments and questions. Mackenzie and I will be happy to support your interest in these animals. And a quick thanks again to Mackenzie for all of his assistance and his unparalleled efforts in getting these amazing creatures 
into the hobby in a way they've never been in the hobby before. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.